Uh, please mute yourselves, except Charlie, of course. And take it away, Charlie. Okay, I am uh, Charlie Sven. I'm AJ9N. I'm actually in Melbourne, Florida. Um, and I am one of the heiress mentors. And uh, last week, uh, Oscar KP4RF called me and said, hey, I'd like to have you do a uh, presentation on Eris, amateur radio on the International Space Station. I said, okay, sure. When, and then he says, okay, this guy Dan's going to, K7REX is going to get in touch with you. And then it's, uh, we're going to go from there. So anyway, that's how we're here. And uh, so today we're going to talk about Eris and how you, uh, everything you want to know about Eris, uh, hopefully I'll cover for you. So this is what I always start out with. Uh, this is obviously the shuttle, and I always say, are you ready for a fun ride? Because uh, I like the shot because you see all the vapor trail and the shock waves and everything. It's pretty cool. Okay, what we're going to talk about is Eris. We're going to do a little bit of commentary on packet and general voice operation, antenna setups. We're going to see some pictures of kids around the world. Go through the application process, and we'll talk a little bit about the actual contact pre during and post. And then I'll have about a 10, 11 minute video of one of my contacts at the end. So uh, stick around for all that if you can. Uh, ARIS is a uh, international program. Uh, Frank Bauer is our lead. Rosalie White at the ARRL is heavily involved. And uh, as I said, it's truly international, all volunteer, and none of us get paid, obviously. Uh, since 83, we've been, there's been several organizations dealing with space flight missions. Uh, the RASAR-X Shuttle Amateur Radio Experiment, which I was also heavily involved with, uh, SafeX, MIRX, and now it is ARIS. And in the future, which we'll talk about, there's some stuff dealing with going to the moon and around that world. So anyway, um, the objectives, mainly to get kids interested in science and technology help out with some of the uh, crew contacts for psychological reasons, among other things, promote amateur radio, make some human space flight awareness and do some experimentation. And uh, ham radio does all that kind of stuff. The uh, program is actually uh, has nine international partners, Belgium, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Japan, Russia, and the United States. There's an actual memo of understanding how to organize everything and run it. And like I said before, this is all volunteer and it's been a very successful program. Early on and even continuing to today was it's, uh, well, let's put a radio on board and it's two-way voice. So here you see uh, the guys talking on the radio early on. We've also got packet capability. Now I'm not really a packet guy, but uh, we do have packet capability and uh, it is operational most days. Uh, if they do have the packet turned on, it'll be pretty active. Future capabilities, some of this is still down the road. Some of it is um, not so much. The DigiTalker, I'm not quite sure really took off. Now SoulScan TV has all of a sudden taken off. So more about that in a second. And there's that second. I've actually downloaded these pictures from the ISS within the last six months or so. Our Russian friends have uh, had three or four or five days of program where they would just send pictures down from the ISS. These were all recorded from my HT being acoustically coupled to my cell phone using a software app called Robot 36. And you can see they're not actually too bad. Now, if I broke out the FT-847 and the full beam and as with elevation rotor control, I would probably have crystal clear pictures. But I didn't think this was too bad for just sort of monkeying around. Uh, we've also got uh, amateur TV. There's some digital stuff that happens every once in a while. Um, You'll just have to pay attention to the announcements to see if something goes on. Uh, Spree and the external express palette, um, that's sort of future maybe, so down the road. So 
Now, if you want to do a contact, there's two ways to do it. One is the direct way. We require two complete stations. We're not talking mobile radios. We're not talking HTs. We're talking radios that can go in, say, one kilohertz steps. This is on the two meter and 70 centimeter band, uh, and it is FM. So the uh, frequency has to be able to handle, say, one kilohertz step or a half kilohertz, something like that because the Doppler shift is plus or minus three and a half kilohertz or thereabouts at two meters and upwards of 10 kilohertz if we're using 70 centimeters. So you really do need to be able to tweak the Doppler. Uh, hands will get away with just about anything. They might just leave it on the downlink frequency and be done with it. But when you got a student population watching you of six or 800 kids, they don't understand all the stack and why it's there. So anyway, we require two radios. The uh, primary we'd like to see with a full azimuth elevation rotor control um, under computer control. Very simple to do that nowadays, not that expensive. And uh, for the backup of radio, we uh, suggest either a two meter vertical uh, or maybe one of the other omnidirectional type antennas. I also have egg beaters. Now the problem is um, the RF radiation patterns off these antennas are different. So if you do have an egg beater, I suggest you also have a vertical with an antenna switch that you could switch in between uh, as the pass happens. The pass is 10 minutes. I tell the backup radio operator, I want you to switch that coax antenna switch back and forth about maybe every 30 seconds and you'll be amazed. And they usually look at me like I'm an idiot until afterwards and they say, wow, that was completely different because the vertical is vertically polarized at the horizon. The egg beater is horizontally polarized at the horizon and circular polarized straight up. So you may have to switch around uh, to get the best signal. Now the idea here is if a rotor fails or the Keplerian data is off or the computer crashes, you can still carry on uh, with a no moving parts antenna system. So. General contact Operations do happen every once in a while. The international downlink is 145.8. Uplink of packet is 145.99, maybe. Uh, you'll just have to check around and see if that's actually being used. Uh, lately, it's at 145.825 simplex. Uh, you see the call signs there that are probably the most famous one on the planet now is NA1SS. And lately, the crossband repeater is active. Not, not today, it's packet, it's been uh, set up, but uh, it has been very active, 437.8 down, 145.99 up at 67 hertz tone. So give it a shot, if you hear them, go ahead and go for it. The Doppler, we uh, talk about that, and here's a little spreadsheet that kind of explains how you have to do things. Uh, the radio on board cannot change frequency, so we have to do it all on the ground. You have to uh, transmit, uh, low to have them hear it high and vice versa. So this is a little bit of a spreadsheet that just show that happened. And here's a graphical showing you the Doppler correction that you may or may not have to do. Crossband repeater is, as I said, has been active. We have a brand new radio on board, Kenwood TMD710GA, heavily modified by Kenwood. And uh, it wasn't up there and turned on more in a day and the repeater was just going bonkers. So give it a shot sometime. As I said, we also do have packet and uh, if you have a packet capability, go ahead and try for it. And this is a picture of the, uh, we have two Kenwood radios on board. This is the older one, mostly set up for a packet, but it can be used for other purposes. Another picture. This is a picture of the brand new radio that went up uh, launched on SpaceX 20, March 6th, got installed September 2nd. So that's how new this thing is. Okay, if you decide you wanna go for a, having a school get in, uh, involved with a contact, how do you do it? Well, there's a director tell bridge. You saw a little picture earlier about how we do the tell bridge setup. I mean, the uh, direct setup, but for the tell bridge, it's a little bit different. We have a phone system to a ham ground station around the world. The school is set up to be on a conference call and uh, to the school, it, it's still ham radio um, and uh, the kids can still have a wonderful uh, conversation with the astronaut on board. Doesn't have to be a direct, but we do have capabilities for Telbridge. 
it's about 65% direct, 35% Telebridge for the breakdown. We have Telebridge stations in these locations and uh, they all, all are very hard working and uh, these guys are all very experienced in how they uh, operate their equipment. So this is a, a map that shows where they're all located at. We used to have one in Hawaii, but they have uh, essentially now retired. But we've got four in Australia, South Africa, two in Argentina, uh, one in Belgium, one in, in Italy, and uh, four in the United States. And occasion, oh, I didn't put it on there. It was five in the United States. Got put W5 Triple R down at Johnson Space Center. Got to add that one in. So that's who we've got when we want to do our Telebridge. And it, to the school, it costs them nothing. The whole ARIS program costs the school nothing, so keep that in mind. You have to have a backup operator. Here's Sam at Tony uh, VK5ZAI, one of our leading uh, Telebridge stations. That's as a pub. This is Sam, uh, all grown up with his buddy Magpie. Unfortunately, uh, Sam is now a silent key, and Magfly flew the coop. But here's Missy. That's Tony's uh, new backup operator. And uh, here's Missy after a, a contact, time to relax. So um, she helps out, I think. We, had, we did have a school in Hawaii. And the reason I put this one up there, even though the, uh, both Nancy and Dick are now retired, um, this is an all Catholic girls school. And at times they basically required, almost required to have one or two of the students help them out. Now. The thing is with a Telbridge, that Telbridge station may be on the air at 2 a.m. because the school is in session, maybe that's noon their time. And so uh, you can see that uh, this could be an interesting time if, if, if you can drag some high school kids to a radio room at 2 a.m. in the morning. If you need to check in on how we do all this stuff, Here's one, I'm gonna repeat this several times. You go to aris.org, you can find all sorts of information, including the proposal uh, data that you would need to fill out if you decide you wanna go for your own contact. Now, the first radios on board are the Ericsson, heavily modified and literally built from the ground up because they really hadn't built these things and the Aris needed them, so they built like six of them or 12 or whatever it was, heavily modified. The FT-100 is supposed to be up there. I'm not sure it's actually there or not, but the plan would be put it on 10 meters. Early on, the radio was this is sort of a cutaway view showing you where the radio equipment's at. Obviously, the ISS is way bigger now, but this is showing a little bit of how it's mounted, one of the radio locations anyway. Now, everybody wants to know about antennas. Here are three of the antennas. There's actually a um, bunch, but here's three of them. I got another picture that's a little bit better. Here are the four um, antennas that are on the service module. Yes, that is like tape measure. That's how you know hams make their uh, antennas a lot of times. The white ray domes do have the S and L band antennas in them. The one on the right is a 10 meter monopole. And you see the clamps, they tell me those clamps can literally hold them, you know, let the thing get hit by a Mack truck. And um, what was interesting with this is that the antennas, uh, it required an EVA. Uh, two of our Russian friends did the EVA, mounted the antennas for us. And the one other thing I do want to mention is Eris was the first non-professional anything to be allowed to have cables go through the bulkheads. That is a real big deal because if you, when they built the thing, if you screw up the through connectors, you could end up killing people, which is not a good thing. So uh, we are very honored to be allowed to do that. And, uh, as you can see later, we've made a lot of contacts. Kind of an in view showing you where the antennas, uh, four of them are located anyway. Get some pictures. Now, early on, the very first antenna was this one they call Cirrus. And you can kind of see what it looks like. 
and that was the beginning of the ISS. Now it's kind of all grown up. So you can see here, I've got two locations. This is the, sort of the location where the uh, radios are located at, and then accordingly the antennas are going to be nearby. So here's one picture. You can see WA3. And I don't know if you can see it on there, but well, a little hard to see the picture on that one. Here are three antennas, a much newer picture. Here's one on the Columbus module. And some more on the Columbus modules. And a close-up view of the patch antenna on the, on the Columbus module. And uh, every once in a while, we have something really cool happen. We had a school in uh, Colorado that we were doing via a telebridge with IK1 SLD in Italy. And it just so happened that there was a guy sort of local with his telescope out. And he was able to take a picture of the ISS at the same time as the uh, contact. I thought this is really pretty cool. You know, it's almost blind luck that he was able to cap capture the picture, but it looks wonderful. So I always, I've been including that one now, ladies. If you're in the packet, this is the box that kind of controls it. Obviously, you see both English and Russian because we do have members of both countries. Now, a little bit of statistics. This is real time. Uh, we had a contact this morning in uh, California. And so I updated this uh, this morning. I maintain all the uh, statistics for ARIS and usually make the first public announcement stuff. So the U.S. has had 456 events. Now let me explain this a little bit. We've had 66 countries, 1,403 events, 1,336 contacts. Now an event is basically the same as a school. And contact may mean we've got multiple events sharing the same time slot. We've done this fairly, uh, not a lot, but over in Europe, uh, you may have two or three schools who are sharing the same 10 minute time slot. Uh, so that's why we end up calling them uh, contacts and events. And uh, I happen to be the control operator for event number one, which was also contact number one. Uh, first ever, and that was back in uh, December of 2000. This is a breakdown per expedition. Right now, we are on Expedition 62, and um, they have done 16 events. And a few statistics on um, the operators. I've kind of cut it off because it, it goes down. Some of them only have had one or two, three contacts, but these are the uh, guys who've done it the most, or women. Uh, so you got Sunita up here, she's done 55. And, but Palo and Luca are the leaders at the moment. So we'll see how that changes as, the, as we go on. The video I'm gonna show a little bit later is with uh, Fairview Elementary in Mount Prospect, Illinois. And we talked to Leroy Chow. So he's down here number tw with 23, so. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about some exotic locations for these area school contacts. Um, antennas are best up on the roof. And um, I don't know about you, but I'm originally from Indiana, so snow and winter doesn't bother me, but the people down south almost don't, they almost don't know what snow even looks like. So we have to show them here. This is me shoveling snow off the roof at Burbank school, Luther Burbank School in Burbank, Illinois, prior to our contact on uh, December 21, 2000. And we were putting together uh, antennas up on the roof. And we had to do field repair of a rotor control cable. This is before I got the Yaesu uh, G5400B, which is a much better system, but we had the U100 and an OAR44, I think and we had to do some fuel repair to the rotor control cable. It was only minus 30 degrees with the wind chill and uh, about zero with, without the wind chill. So uh, uh, 
the schools down south don't understand when we tell them that you know this is nothing and they they're, they're freezing at 60 degrees but so i also did a contact from adler planetarium if you've ever gotten to chicago it's a wonderful museum uh you might want to check out a little bit of snow on the ground there these are the antennas up on the dome of the building school in tennessee they brought out a trailer and everything to have their equipment uh, Challenger Learning Center in, in, in Illinois, they had up on the roof. This is uh, Fairview Elementary, which I said we'll, we'll see a video a little bit later and uh, how we put up the antennas on the roof. This was in February. We got real lucky. It was about 50 degrees that day, 55 degrees, and we could operate without jacket. You can see I just have a sweatshirt on. Uh, at Liberty Junior High, here's a little bit of a picture of how I do the equipment now. It's all rack mounted in gator cases that are the wheelie ones that you can just pull two guys lift it up it's up on a table and you're good to go in about 10 minutes and here's the other uh, gator case with the audio mixer and power supply and stuff so that's how i set up this is just one of the two stations we have another station which you don't see in the pictures here so are we going to have fun yet some happy kids these kids are all done with their contact this was a school in st john indiana that i mentored uh, school Mount Prospect, I was mentor and the control operator for. A school in Bloomington, Illinois, which I mentored. That's the Challenger Learning Center. Uh, Japan, that school in Tennessee I mentored. They did it in a tent. They had a big tent, two uh, uh, parochial schools. They combined them in a big tent outside. You kind of really don't recommend that unless you're pretty sure it's not going to rain. Uh, Canada, another one up in Nunavut. This, con this school is so far up that uh, a direct contact would not be possible. The ISS would only get about a degree or two above the horizon, if that. So we do these with a tell bridge. So we include everybody. Uh, school in Greenfield, Indiana, the Netherlands. Uh, Thailand at the Scout Jambo, and there's always one guy who has to be really cool dude. Uh, Kursk, Russia, they've done a fair number of uh, contacts from Kursk Technical University. School I mentored in South Bend, Indiana. Uh, McBride High School out in Long Beach. Um, had a pretty good crowd in the audience. And the latest school that I mentored was in Rockwall, Texas. And uh, we even had one young lady there who decided she had to get all dressed up, space suit, helmet, and everything. I guess she's ready to go if they decide they need some help. Okay, let's go into a little bit about the uh, application process. Twice a year, for about a two-month window each time, Eris will accept proposals. Uh, the spring window is for the first half of the next year. The fall window is for the second half of the next year. And like I've mentioned before, if you just go to aris.org, you will find all the information there for uh, applica uh, applying. Or if you want to, you can go to the, uh, w, uh, to the ARRL. And um, probably there you want to uh, do a search on ARIS, and it'll take you right to the right page. ARIS will select the schools initially based on an educational proposal. We want the kids to learn something, not just get up there and ask questions. And we'd like to have the schools really, you know, do something that's meaningful, science-wise, et cetera. Um, the final acceptance for the school depend on whether they successfully complete an equipment list. Um, and we, we do look that over, and if they get that approved, they're on the list and we shoot for a contact. Some schools we've had to go around and around a few times to get their equipment uh, in order and then they carry it on. The proposal, they look at, there's a committee. I am not on the committee. I'm uh, one of the um, technical mentors. That means we do the radio side of the house. This is, we have uh, hams who are uh, teachers or former teachers and they are part of the committee that look at things like education, logistics, outreach, how the reporting is going to go. This is stuff that they look at. They tell us uh, when the schools get approved. 
So if you're interested, like I said, go to theiris.org. If you know people who are international, uh, by all means, still go to theiris.org, and there will be links there that will take them to their uh, country's uh, governing body, so to speak, that will uh, have whatever they need to apply with at, at their web page. So if you know people in Europe and you think that you might be interested in this, Send them to aris.org and let them go hunt for the proper information for their location. Uh, as I said, the plans need to include, uh, you know, what the study topics are going to be. They're going to be related to space technology, space exploration, space research, uh, communications, wireless technology, radio science, all that kind of stuff is what will be very helpful to have on the application. Uh, the more advanced that preparation is, uh, the more learning and value that Eris event will be. And uh, you might even have, you know, imagine having the kids interview the astronaut, which is what we're here for to explain all that. And maybe your kids as well will actually build the antenna. You never know. Some schools have, that, have done that. The kids actually built the antenna from scratch, and that's what they use. The ARRL has an education and technology program and NASA that will um, provide resources. So if you need some additional resources, by all means, check out them. Uh, if you go to the ARL, you can go preparation for errors contact and there's some links there also. So I am going to repeat a few times uh, the links to uh, get get on to uh, maybe having a proposal sent in. Okay, the application process is in effect right now. Um, this would be for a contact between July 1, 2021 and December 31, 2021. That window ends November 24, 2020. So if you think you've got a school that you wanna have happen, by all means, go to aris.org, download the paperwork you need, talk with the school, and uh, go for it. If you uh, need help, by all means, uh, let me know. I'm, I'm at aj9n at aol.com, and I'll sort of let you uh, Fire away with questions, and we'll try to help you out the best I can. Okay, now what is a contact, pre, middle of the contact, and post? What does that kind of look like? So let's go through that a little bit. About six months out before the contact, a mentor is assigned to the school. We all volunteer. We get the list from the education uh, committee. We, and it's up for grabs. It usually doesn't last more than an hour or two once I post the schools. All the other mentors grab a school that they're interested in, and uh, it goes from there. The mentor then contacts the school to see if they're still interested. Believe it or not, we've had times where the uh, school had a teacher leave the school or the principal left, and no longer was the main contact there that was interested, so the school said, nope, we're not interested. Kind of a shame, but that's what happens. Eventually, the school would get a list of best week predictions. What that means is that at six months out, we really can't tell you the day or the time of a contact. We're way too far out. We can kind of tell you uh, this week or this week or this week. It looks like uh, a, a direct contact can be made. Telebridges are no, uh, no problem because we have school uh, – stations all around the world so that's not a problem but if it's a direct we give them the best weeks and we say okay now we can maybe this week it's maybe the afternoon uh this week it's maybe morning and afternoon uh and so forth and we tell the school kind of tell us what weeks will work best for you and then we'll try to accommodate that so they get a list of weeks and uh, they have to tell us what they think might work about as I say, about six months out, five months out, they're going to tell us what weeks will work. About a month and a half to two months out, uh, the mentor is going to assign, uh, will present to the school a specific week and the predicted times for each day and ask for the school to prioritize that list. So sometimes we get lucky. There may be two times on, say, Monday. Uh, one time on Tuesday, one time on Wednesday, no times on Thursday, four times on Friday, some crazy thing. And anyway, we tell the school, you guys know your calendar, we don't. 
So you have to prioritize them. And we tell them that if there's a date and time on there that will not work, by all means, strike it out. Don't even put it on your list of options. Because if you do, it is considered fair game. We've had some schools that had like 15 options and they got option number 12. And it's like, well, we didn't really want option 12. Well, you left it on the list, it's fair game. So if you don't like it, you take it off and nobody will even know about it. Five to seven days out, um, I mean, the uh, not five to seven, the top five to seven days from the school are given to the ISS planners. Um, we pray that they will pick one of those days. And like I said, yes, the flight surgeons are God, so they can override everything. Um, sometimes we get lucky, sometimes we don't. Hopefully 10 to 14 days out, we get a confirmed time. Uh, we've had the confirmed date and time given to us as late as 36 hours out and we have been aborted 10 minutes before acquisition of signal. So I had a school in Illinois, um, 10 minutes before the contact, uh, they t called me and said, we're aborting. Uh, the, the ISS was going to an, an emergency maneuver uh, to do avoidance maneuver. Uh, the crew each went into their safe room, slammed the hatches shut and in case they actually hit something. So, um, Every once in a while that happens. Luckily, it's not very often. Still pre-contact. I always recommend my schools that they do set up on Saturday. You can get a lot of people to come out on Saturday to help set up. Maybe get some parents. Maybe the teachers will come out. Maybe the principal will help at a school. The school you're going to see the video on. The principal was up on the roof with me, and she thought it was great. She actually took video of everything, and she had a blast. Um, test it out, test, test, test. It takes probably on setup day anywhere from five to eight to nine hours of setup time. Depends on what you're going to do. Uh, then the, what happens is the antennas will be left on the roof. The cabling will be disconnected from the radios. Cabling will be pulled back for safe uh, storage. The radios may be locked away because if you have a contact on a Wednesday, you don't want all the radios set up in the room and have it maybe walk away or get damaged by the kids. So on the morning of the actual contact, the crew gets in there very early, rehooks up the uh, antennas to the radios, checks out everything, and uh, waits for contact time. And I always tell the audience that uh, don't have a panic attack. If they're not allowed to panic unless I panic, and then I tell them I don't panic. So uh, usually they've stayed pretty calm. Okay, contact is 10 minutes of what I call your most stressful yet fun time in your life. Uh, this is an experiment and experiments do fail. Um, happens every once in a while. Uh, hang in there, relief is almost done. Pray the equipment keeps working. That's why we have two complete setups. Uh, I tell the hams, think of this as a super field day. Not so much because of the technical equipment, but it's the audience that you're dealing with. They don't understand all this radio business. And so uh, they think you're almost talking to them on the telephone only, so. Post contact, let it all hang out. I tell the schools, I do not know what's gonna happen one microsecond after the contact is over. My job is done. Yours is beginning, but usually what happens is that the kids are going yelling and screaming high-fiving and the parents are crying. That's usually what happens. I tell the schools, uh, have everyone sign the log and I uh, work with them to get a QSL card. And there's a reporting uh, mechanism we have to get to the mentor. We'll take any audio files, digital pictures, videotape, any that kind of stuff. We'll take that as soon as it's available. And there's a survey that'll uh, basically help keep the funding going at NASA for the ARIS program. This is the main prize, so to speak. This is a QSL of the front side of the QSL card for the ISS. And here's the back side. So you can see I, this is a contact I did in September of 2006. And uh, 
I tell the schools, any kid who talked, uh, any principal or school official who talked on the microphone, um, they get to apply for a two-way QSL. And anybody in the school who listened in who wants a, a QSL, they apply for a shortwave listening one. I basically tell the school just get a list of people who want a card and we'll work from there. Then we'll have to individually file a report. But we tell the school that we would really like the kids, the each who talk, they actually fill out their own some sort of QSL card, which usually means it's an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Now, there's a bunch of new stuff happening that is going to be next two, three, four, five years. A lot going on. We're going to the moon and beyond. So you're gonna look for aerospace equipment in new places and you're gonna look for new ways to make contact. Now, this stuff is, uh, some of it's in the early planning, some of it's midway through the planning, some of it's pretty far into the planning, some of the equipment's actually been built, some of it hasn't. So it remains to be seen how all this is gonna to fit together. So stay tuned. And one of the new pieces of equipment that's up there now on the ISS in which uh, uh, it's gonna help us a lot. It's called the Interoperable Radio System. Um, it was launched on that SpaceX CRS-20 mission back on March 6th, I got to see that. What you're seeing on the top are two power supplies that are multi-voltage. You can pick a voltage in, different voltage out. It does, there's like three voltages in and four out including there's a USB one, something like that. Because it turns out the ISS does not have the same voltage in all locations. So go figure. They have 120 volts DC, they have 28 volts DC, there's five volts and there's another one that I can't remember what that one is. But. So these were specially built uh, by Eris uh, volunteers. And uh, this is a uh, picture of the radio that's on board now, hooked up to one of the uh, interoperable power supplies. And you see all the specialty cabling and stuff. These radios are specially modified, have to go through all sorts of testing, not only for uh, radio interference, electromagnetic like interference, but they have to worry about the plastics outgassing and maybe killing somebody from the gas. So these things go through extensive testing and our friends at Kenwood heavily modified it and they donated the radio. And this is the launch that took uh, the radio and the uh, power supplies up. Got to watch that one. It was really cool, SpaceX. This is the one where the booster came back, landed maybe a half mile from where it started. Really cool. Now, the thing I mentioned before, we're going to the moon, around the moon, maybe even to Mars. So there's uh, new programs coming into play uh, amateur radio exploration, AREX. Um, it's going to have hands on engagement. There's going to be that 10 minute pass no longer. It's going to go 12 hours, maybe, or 10 hours, or eight hours. Could be voice, could be pictures, television, all sorts of experimental data. Who knows what? We don't really know just yet. It's going to be leveraging the Aeris International support, expertise, capabilities, all that. Um, going to be coupled with the uh, AMSAT International Deep Space Satellite Development. And hardware development is going to be performed at no cost to the space agencies. All we need to do is get it on board somehow and get it up there. So it's a worldwide team, not just AERIS, but AMSAT, the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, is heavily involved with all the HAMSATs and, and AERIS programs. Few pictures uh, illustrating what we're sort of talking about. There's uh, operational segments. We've got the user segment. Those are the schools. They're going to have ham operators at the school. There's educational outreach, some experimentation. You got the space segment. That's the crew. So you might have a crew tenant. It might be you know you might actually talk to a crew member, or it could be autonomous, which means maybe it's a repeater. Maybe you're getting telemetry. And you got the operations control segment, which is uh, uh, contingency operations uh, for controlling the radios. And uh, I don't know if you realize this or not, ARIS is a backup communication system for the ISS. In 
case their equipment has uh, issues. And we have uh, been in play a couple times for that. So um, all this can play into the uh, us helping them and them helping us. Some operational scenarios. Again, all this stuff, um, this is real new. I don't know where it's going to land just necessarily yet. But uh, we're thinking uh, uh, X band down, C band up maybe. Um, Maybe it'll be 70 centimeters. As I say, this is happening today. There's people in the background, so to speak, who are working on all this. Um, I'm not directly involved with any of this. Uh, and so uh, as this stuff comes into fruition, the world will be finding out about it. So make sure you stay tuned and uh, we'll see what happens. So. If you're also so inclined, uh, you're welcome to help the program out. You can, we'll, we'll take any donations. And so if you go to amsat.org slash donate, click on the Ares donations, we'll take anything uh, we can get to help us out because the equipment is a little bit expensive. So, so any questions before we um, go forward? Let me uh, pull this out of screen sharing here a moment. Uh, if I can see, stop share. And I'll throw that open to questions. Okay. Uh, I don't see we'll anybody do the with the hands up yet. Barry, do you see anything in the, do you see anything in the uh, uh, chat queue? No questions in the chat queue for now. Okay. Uh, I see somebody comment about Keith Pugh helped out uh, at Zuni. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, Keith is now a silent key. If you are, didn't know that, uh, He's now a silent key, so. Uh, hmm. And uh, we, uh, let's see, something about the one in Perth. Um, I couldn't figure that out myself. <laughs> uh, it's VK, uh, VK6, I can't think of it right at the moment. Um, it's got VK6MJs. Um, I'd have, sorry, I'm catching this on the fly. Um, I can look that up real quick, but I don't know if we need it. I can pass that along to you guys later rather than taking up time here. I'm not sure. Um, the PowerPoint, by the way, is on my uh, Dropbox. And Dan has the link for the uh, PowerPoint and a link for the uh, video file. So if you're so inclined, uh, Dan, you, wanna, you can pass that around to whoever you want to pass it to. And feel free to download it, and we'll go from there. So, um, is that all the? Uh, do we have more? Let's see. I guess that's it on the chat box. In the chat, what, will this be a, a, a PPT presentation? I think you yeah. answered that. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, the PowerPoint I just showed you. That that's available on my Dropbox. So you. Dan wants to pass along the links. You're welcome to do that, Dan, and anybody who wants it can go ahead and download it. And, yeah, everybody, uh, everybody will get a copy of that. Not a problem, okay. as well as this video. Okay. Now, the minute I go to uh, the video, I lose uh, audio with you guys. So uh, once I start, um, it, it could be a little wild and crazy here. So um, I do have a question now from the chat. Sure, go ahead. Do you recommend a handheld Yagi for a handheld handy talkie? For an actual air school contact? I would imagine that. Neither one. Neither, that, right. will be, that will not be allowed. Um, the reason for that is the handheld radio is five watts, maybe. We want to see 100 watts or more. The, uh, you, let's see if you want to hold a, a Yagi antenna for 10 minutes, tracking a 17,500 mile an hour uh, obstacle uh, in the sky and have your arm try to stay uh, strong enough so it doesn't flop, OK? Yep. So, <laughs> Um, we want to see uh, radios that 
handle, uh, like I said, the uh, frequency set, uh, splits. Uh, one killer steps is ideal. Um, we're talking radios like a FT847, TS2000, new ICOM 9700, that sort of thing. Um, but you do not have to have a 100 watt output radio. RF amps are okay. So like if you have a 50 watt output radio and you got an amp that can handle uh, say up to 50 watts in and it cranks out 150 watts, uh, that's what uh, we would expect to see uh, for both the primary and the backup radio. We want these radios to be, um, we're amateurs doing a professional job to put it sort of bluntly. And uh, we, we, we were at a school and they don't understand things that the hams might be just willing to go along with. So we, we like to see pretty good equipment being used and, uh, and so forth. Now, if you are wanting to make a general contact uh, to the uh, crossband repeater, or uh, if you get lucky and one of the astronauts is on, which is very rare, uh, you can give it a shot with your handheld and your HT. Um, but you gotta remember, FM capture effect is fully in play. He, who is he or she who is strongest into the, into the receiver wins. <laughs> so, um, and the Aeros con school contacts, we are using a public downlink frequency but the uplink frequency is private. And uh, that's for obvious reasons. We actually have two sets of frequencies, both use the same public downlink, but the uplinks are kept private. We had problems way, way in the past. And so every once in a while we do have to change the uplink frequency. So the, uh, when the crew member is uh, ready to make his contact, he is looking for only one call sign. He will ignore anybody else and uh, we are only looking for one call sign to come back down and uh, we'll ignore everybody else. So, um, but if you get lucky and you hear a crew member just say on a Sunday afternoon, he decides to get on, make contacts, go for it. Got an HT and a, a Yagi handheld, go for it. See what happens. You might, might get it, might not. Um, but you might want to go a little bit better on the antennas for sure. Um, you know, as I say, FM capture effect, the one with the loudest signal wins. So anyway, does that answer the question? Um, I think that does. Is okay. there a minimum wattage and minimum angle above horizon for a contact? Um, okay, for the school contacts, we, we have a guy who's a retired NASA guy who does the orbital calculations. He's like in his 80s, maybe. He'll change like the seventh decimal place of a Keplerian number just because he looks at it and he does the math in his head and says, now we need to change that. And he'll be spot on. He provides uh, the uh, orbital dates and times for school contacts. And his part of his uh, criteria is that um, we are looking for a max elevation pass of uh, over 20 degrees if we can. He may go down to 10 degrees, but at least we were going to shoot for, say, 20. That'll give the school, who usually has very inexperienced hams from a satellite perspective, uh, have, a, have a good contact. Now, if it's a telebridge, we will let them go down to the horizon, basically, a couple degrees above the horizon. These guys are all well experienced. They all have excellent equipment, and, and, and they know how to handle um, – so if we have one that maybe is five degrees max elevation pass, uh, we'll try not to schedule that kind of contact. But if that's what it ends up being, and that's what we can do with a tell bridge, uh, it could happen that way. Very rare, but does. Uh, but for the school on their own, uh, we basically don't go that low for the beginning. I mean, for the max, we're always looking at the max elevation. If you get a 90 degree max elevation pass, that is really cool because uh, that's the longest time you'll be able to have for a pass. They last eight and a half to 10, a little over 10 minutes. That's what you get. Sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more, but that's about the range. 
So, and somebody's asking about ham TV. Um, the digital transmitter for uh, the ham TV failed and it was brought back down to earth. It's now in Italy. Um, I think it's been repaired or darn close to being repaired. They've had it there quite a long time now. And uh, I do not know when it would be going back up. And uh, somebody's asking about the VCH1. Um, I think they've got it up there still, but I do not think they're really using it because I think it's had problems in the past and didn't really work out as, as well as they thought it would be doing. So um, not to say that it won't happen, but uh, that's few and far between, I think. I think the, the SoulScan TV stuff that you're going to see more of is um, the idea that you'll, you'll have a, like a four or five day period, eight different uh, files will be sent down. You try to copy them. And uh, there's actually a little award you can apply for if you send one in and uh, have a, uh, a send in your picture that you've downloaded. So I've gotten that a few times. Our friends over in Europe are managing this uh, certificate of program for that. Uh, somebody's asking about the FTM 400 and the 991A. Uh, let's see, is the 991A got two meters and 70 centimeters? I'm not super familiar with yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, it does. Okay. Um, and it, it would be able to go in one kilohertz steps because that radio's got sideband and FM and stuff. So mm -hmm. you should, now the FTM 400, I'm not familiar with that one. What does that one got? Is that a mobile? Yeah. I, I can't know. I know the FT ninety one A ninety one A would work. I'm not sure what the FTM four hundred is. Four hundred is a is a two meter four forty um, radio mobile fifty watts. Okay. Um, no, that would not be a recommended radio. Uh, the mobile radios are and the HTs do not typically have one kilohertz steps. Now. Most of those radios are five kilohertz steps, which means you're either going to have to be plus five kilohertz high on the Doppler or zero or minus five kilohertz, which is not optimum. Uh, so if you come in with a mobile radio, expect it to be rejected on your equipment plan. And uh, so, uh, so anything uh, uh, that is a mobile radio only is probably off the and any HT is automatically off because it's the same thing. And I have somebody's asking, no, it's not just the FT847. That's that's what I happen to have, but there's all sorts of radios that are out there that uh, um, are available. Most there's a lot of hams that are in AMSAT that will be willing to loan your equipment. So if you don't have it, you still want to have a, a contact by all means. Go ahead and apply. If you get accepted, we'll work with the school to figure out what kind of equipment is maybe available. And uh, we've worked with schools in the past on that. So, uh, but uh, no, it's not just safety for the TS2000. The, there's some of the, was it TS790? Um, there's ICOM, um, uh, two, was it 281 and 481? Those radios, I think it is. So there's a, there's a, it doesn't have to be a brand new radio. It just needs to have a bunch of memory locations. We like to have um, at least 14 memory locations. What you're going to do is store seven um, memory locations for each of the two channels that we give you. And then as the contact progresses, you switch from one memory to the next, to the next, to the next. Do not use a VFO because if you bump the VFO, who knows where you're at. And uh, with the, with the, uh, one killer step, you're plenty good enough uh, into the uh, band pass of the radio. So, um, okay, any other questions? Uh, I got All right, let me uh, let me close that thing down, and uh, let me go ahead and bring up the um, um, video. And as I say, uh, it, it, the audio, I think takes over and I won't be able to hear you until we uh, uh, get on the flip side. So is, is everybody okay with that? Take her away. All righty. Let me uh, make sure I share again. I'm good there. We click that.
NA1SS, NA1SS, AJ9N, Alpha Juliet 9, Norway on schedule. And bye. <laughs> NA1SS, NA1SS, this is AJ9N, Alpha Juliet 9, Norway on schedule. And bye. NA1SS AJ9 in. Leroy, we barely got you. Give us another call. NA1SS AJ9 in. NA1SS, Azzy Loud and Clear. Uh, Abby. NA1SS, Azzy Loud and Clear. we're getting you 5x5 five by five right at the moment and climbing. The handle is Charlie, and we'll go right to the first question. NA1SS AJ9 in. One more time. How copy? Copy Loud and Clear. Hello, Charlie, and uh, welcome, my friends at uh, Fairview Elementary. Welcome aboard the International Space Station. Have you? My name is Isabella. Have you seen other planets besides Earth? Over. Hi, Isabella. That's a very good question. Well, we do look at the, uh, the stars and, the, and we do see other planets, but they do appear like stars just like they do on Earth because we're only about 250 miles closer to them, but they look very clear and very beautiful. Over. My name is Kaylani. Can you see the constellations? Over. Yes, Kaylani. We have a very good view of the constellations. Um, because there's no atmosphere for the light to go through, the stars actually don't twinkle, so it's very clear. It's like being on top of a dark mountain top, and uh, we can see some very neat constellations. Over. My name is Vinny. Do you ever see? Do you ever want to take a trip to the moon? Over. Well, Drake, I tell you, I would love to take a trip to the moon, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to get back there in not too long, and uh, maybe one of you kids can be the first person on Mars. My name is Sean. Is it always dark in space? Over. Well, Sean, it's only dark when you're on the night side of the Earth, just like it is on, on the ground there. And uh, so about 45 minutes of our orbit is dark and 45 minutes is light. Over. My name is Ver Veronica. Do you miss your family? Well, Veronica, yes, I do miss my family very much. Miss my family and friends and other things about uh, being on the Earth, but it's uh, a really neat experience to be in space. Over. My name is Max. Is it hard to sleep in space? Over. Max, that's a, that's a good question. It uh, takes a little bit of getting used to, but after a few days, uh, it's very, very comfortable. Over. My name is Harmony. What do you miss about not being at home? Over. Well, Harmony, I of course miss my uh, my wife, and my family, and friends, and uh, other things like that. But um, you know, I'm I'm going to be home probably in about uh, two and a half, three months, so it won't be too long. Over. My name is Olivia. What are some of your discoveries this mission? Over. Well, Olivia, we uh, do a lot of different science experiments on board. Um, one of the things that we do is something called telemedicine. We've been using an ultrasound machine to. Uh, to show that we can take orders from the ground from different doctors and uh, scan each other. And that was a neat discovery for me to discover that even though I'm not a medical doctor, I can still do these kinds of measurements. Over. My name is Sarah. How can you take baths without floating in the air? Over. Well, Sarah, you know, we don't really take baths like you do on the ground there. What we do is uh, we use uh, wristless body baths and shampoos and uh, wet towels, just like they do in hospitals with people who are sick and can't get out of bed. But uh, we use the same soaps and things like that, and it all works very well. It's just not as, doesn't feel quite as good as a nice hot shower, though. Over. My name is Doug. What was the funniest accident or moment that you had ever happened to you in space? Over. Well, Doug, when, uh, you know, when you're looking out in deep space, it's so, it's so dark that you can't really uh, tell how far away things are. And so one time I thought I saw a satellite, and uh, it turned out it was just a speck of dust about three feet from, uh, from the window. It was being very brightly lit up by the, uh, by the sun. And so for a few minutes uh, it looked like it was a satellite, but it turned out to be nothing more than a piece of dust. Over. My name is Mike. What weather observations have you seen from space? Over. Mike, we can see an awful lot from space. Uh, I took some pictures of uh, Tropical Storm Mufta a little while ago, and of course the, uh, the tsunami, while we didn't see the tsunami, we sure saw the effects of it afterwards, and uh, uh, we took some uh, pictures of the areas that were really affected by the, that event. Over. My name is Emma. What is the food that you miss the most? Over. Well, Emma, the space food is not bad, but I'll tell you, it's nothing like, a, nothing like something on the ground, you know, nothing like a big steak or a nice, uh, nice Chinese meal or something like that. So I'd have to say it's, uh, there are a lot of things I miss just about. <laughs> Over. NA1SS, AJ9N. 
My name is Kaylani. Is Neptune really blue over? Well, Kaylani, I have to say I haven't really seen Neptune. I mean, I've looked at the stars and planets, but uh, I haven't picked out Neptune. But if it looks blue on the ground, it probably looks blue from up here. Over. My name is Vinny. How many times in one day do you pass over my own prospect, Illinois? Over. Well, Vinny, we don't really pass over every day. Uh, today is uh, one day that we're, of course, passing over, which is why we can talk to each other. But uh, it depends on our orbit and uh, the way the Earth is rotating and the way we're orbiting. But So we don't really pass over every day. We probably pass over the Chicago area, oh, I'd say uh, maybe uh, once every, uh, every few days. Over. My name is Veronica. Did you ever bring an animal with you? Over. Well, Veronica, we don't have any animals on board. The only animals are on board are, are the two of us right now. Uh, on some of my previous missions, we did have some small animals on board. We had some very small fish that were like uh, kind of like minnows and uh, some very small jellyfish. Over. My name is Max. How big is the spaceship? Over. Well, Max, the space station is actually quite large, especially for two people. Um, it's probably the size, uh, volume inside of a, a good-sized two- or three-bedroom apartment, so it's plenty big for us. Over. My name is Harmony. What is one thing you've learned being up in the space station? Over. Well, Harmony, something that I've relearned, and I, I learn every time I come up into space, but especially this time since it's a long flight, is just how very beautiful our Earth is. And every time I come back into space, I'm reminded once again how every part of the Earth is beautiful in its own way. Over. My name is Sarah. Can you see rain or snow from space? Over. Well, Sarah, we're above the rain and the snow, so it, we can see clouds when it's snowing or raining on the ground. And uh, after the clouds clear, we can sure see if the ground is wet or uh, covered with snow. Over. My name is Doug. How does it feel to exercise in space? Over. Well, Doug, it feels really good to exercise in space. We have to exercise every day to kind of keep our muscles and our hearts in good shape for, so that we can come back to gravity and, and be okay. So it's just like on the ground. It's always a good feeling after you get done with a good workout. Over. My name is Emma. What activities do you do on your free time? Over. Well, Emma, as I was talking about, there's nothing more beautiful than the Earth, and one thing I really enjoy is taking photographs of the Earth. It's kind of become my new hobby, so I spend a lot of time in my free time taking pictures, looking out the window, and uh, looking at my pictures. Over. My name is Carrie Swabble. What do you talk about in space? Oh, hello, Carrie. I'm sorry, I missed the first part of your question. Can you ask that again? Uh, Leroy, give us that again. Uh, could you, uh, could the, can I hear the last question again, please? What do you talk about in space? What do we talk about in space? Well, we talk about uh, things like you talk about on the ground, I guess. We talk about the day's work. We talk about things that we've seen out the window. And, and we talk about our families and friends and uh, things we're looking forward to when we come back to Earth. Over. Leroy, we've actually run through our questions. Can you give real quick, how do you all go to the bathroom? That's a question I always get asked, and they are always afraid to ask it. Go ahead. Well, of course, we have very specially designed uh, facilities to use, and uh, they use fans and separators to kind of keep things together. And so the answer to how you go to the bathroom in space is very carefully. And, of course, you always step your own methods. Really, really, we got about 30 seconds. We're going to sign off, and we'll say... Anyone SSAJ nine in? Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Shelley, and, uh, and everyone at Sarah Joe Elementary there at South Prospect, Illinois. It's been a real pleasure talking to you again. I look forward to seeing you soon when I, when I get back to you guys. I'll take care and uh, have a more time to all your dreams. All right, that's what everybody think of the video. Wonderful. Always, always. <laughs> she makes me choke up. Excellent. Yeah, the uh, principal, uh, Carrie, she, she actually was up on the roof with us. And, and uh, the, uh, this was a crew pick school. Um, and it's like, well, how, how, how do they pick the school? We allow the astronauts to pick a school. If they want to talk to the school, we're going to set it up for them. And mm -hmm. so we did some investigations like, well, how is he related to the school? And it's, well, well did he go there? Nope. Relative go there? Nope. 
wife go there? Nope. Teach there? Nope. Um, he was invited to the school uh, to talk before he went up. Uh, one of the parents works at McDonald's. And uh, in Oak Brook, Illinois is Hamburger University. That's where you go to school to learn how to run a McDonald's. And uh, Leroy Chow gave a talk at McDonald's. And this parent found out about it and said, um, well, you know, that'd be great if we could have him come and talk to our school. Now you could actually apply to NASA to have an astronaut come and talk. You have to pick up the tab for like logistics and hotel and stuff like that. But essentially, technically it's for free. But um, so the school said, um, well, we could do that. McDonald's said, oh, no, 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 we've already paid for everything. He's going to talk in the morning. You can have him in the afternoon. So he came and talked, and he did a wonderful job. And uh, the next thing you know, Eris gets this uh, list from Leroy, and uh, Mount Prospect had this Fairview Elementary on the list. So it's like, okay, so I contact the school, and uh, do, you, do you need do you have uh, your local hams you want to help out? No, we, we'll go with you guys. Okay, so fine, we did. And... Um, so we did a contact. Now you, you might be saying, well, how did he get invited to McDonald's in the first place? Well, before Leroy got married, I, the story's a little fuzzy. So I don't know whether it was his then fiance or his wife, but he was getting an award at a uh, banquet and his uh, now wife ended up talking to a McDonald's vice president. And she told him that Leroy had worked at McDonald's in California when he was in high school. Light bulbs went off, famous alum from McDonald's is now an astronaut. So that's how he got invited to talk at McDonald's and McDonald's picked up the tab for all that. So I thought that was pretty cool. Well, I'm not done yet with this little story. The school invited Leroy to come back after the, uh, he got back down to earth and he did. And the school picked up the tab for everything. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been to Chicago, but the Drake Hotel downtown Chicago is like three to four or five hundred dollars a night. So they put them up for like two nights there, and they paid for the uh, airplane fare. And of course, they bought they got them a rental car. Doesn't everybody drive a Jaguar for the rental car? That's what they got him. So. Uh, I got invited to come up for the uh, ceremony, got to meet him. He signed uh, the T-shirt that the school had designed. Uh, he signed my T-shirt. And uh, uh, I've got that framed under glass right now. And while we're there, they took him. They weren't done yet with him. They took him back into the library and said, we have enough money. We are going to overhaul the library and rename it with your name. Whoa. Like I said, this is an old city, but they got a lot of money. And I was invited back for that ceremony, but I said, well, I'm going to have to bow out because our son just graduated from college and he wants to be in Hawaii. And so I said, I'm not going to fly like 4,000 miles back to Chicago for two hours and fly back to Hawaii. Not going to happen, but enjoy your ceremony and congratulations for that, everything. So um, it was a wonderful contact. And Louis Roy just bent over backwards for the school. He even was sending him 12 megabit, 12 megapixel uh, files of pictures. One of the ones they sent me, I could zoom, 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 zoom down in, and I could read the tail number on the jet on the runway at O'Hare Airport. That's how good the handheld camera they got up there. Really cool stuff. So anyway, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. If you've got questions, fire away. And by all means, visit aris.org if you want to think you want to apply for your own school. And uh, the, as I say, the links for the Dropbox for the two files are available. And I'm sure Dan will send that out to everybody. You betcha. Looks like Oscar wants to give you a question. Go ahead, Oscar. Charlie, your presentation is awesome. And it's so exciting, like being there every time that we have done contact because it does attract our attention. I hope that many people here get to get, get to know you and you show them the path that they can go back and write proposals 
and get the schools involved and work with the youth so we can develop the new workforce. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Oscar. And Oscar was the one that suggests he contact me and say, hey, I'd like you to give a talk. I'm going to put you in touch with this guy, Dan. And the next thing you know, it's downhill from there. So <laughs> anyway, but uh, glad everything was uh, hopefully enjoyable for everybody. And uh, if you want me to talk again sometime, by all means, get in touch with me. Love to. And I might add that Oscar's over in Puerto Rico. We have people on here from all over the United States. You have a head count of how many people were actually here? We were uh, over how many? Well, we were about 88, I think, for the max. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah, we afterwards, uh, we put this, we take this video, I post it with the, the notes and all that, and I send it out to way over 500 people. That gets forwarded to the other places, gets put on uh, websites, um, YouTubes, you name it. So a lot of people see these things, and uh, uh, I see a lot of action on the video, on, on watching the video. So it's, it's something that just keeps it going. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank everybody for uh, watching and sticking with me. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah. I'll see 73s, everybody. Thank you. All right, Charlie. You uh, let's take a, a quick look here and see if we got any more questions. Barry, do you see anything in the chat? Nothing in the chat. Okay. Well, it has. I got a quick, quick question. Uh, what website actually is this? Uh, I got it on an email, so, uh, but it never said what, what side it I connected to. The only way, the, go ahead, Barry. Do you want the AMPSAT website or the website for this group? Uh, the website for this group. We don't actually have a website for this group. We send out a weekly uh, uh, invitation. We do these things twice a week. Uh, on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Wednesdays is general amateur radio, like this is this. Tomorrow will be uh, focused more for the areas or disaster communication side, side of things. Uh, we get anywhere from, um, I don't know, from uh, 80 and I like the nice. So sometimes over 500 people attending these meetings. They're a lot of fun and very educational. So um, we, uh, when I send out the email this time, I have a link for people who want to join uh, a group we have that would get the announcements and such if they want to do that. Yeah, we have a group no discussion area for this. And that's probably where you got it from. Unfortunately, right now, unless we make some changes, uh, everybody's into the a common area where a lot of uh, disaster communication talks are taking place. Right. And we may end up changing that because there are some people that uh, that is not an interest to them and they end up leaving because they don't see what they what they're what they're really after. So we may we may change that in the near future. But right now, that's where we're putting everybody in the one spot. Thank you. Okay. Can, can I jump in here really fast? Sure. Go for yes. it. Daryl K. Six O S C. Charlie came out to my school, and I'm a retired teacher. We did a school contact, and uh, you really can't overstate the impact this has on students. It's pretty powerful stuff, and uh, Charlie definitely, if he panicked, I couldn't see any panic, so uh, good job, and nice presentation too, Charlie. Thanks, Daryl. Daryl is, uh, when I was still in Los Angeles, well, I was in Huntington Beach, Daryl had a school, um, in Los Angeles proper that uh, we did a school contact from and it worked out pretty well, I thought. And uh, so we drug him in as a, now he's what they call an, an AEA, he's an Aris Educational Ambassador. And a couple of the guys that helped out with that contact are now Aris Mentors, because I knew I was moving to Florida, uh, being near our grandkids. And I needed some people in California, so we, we suckered a few of them in and I, well, they, they basically volunteered anyway. But uh, so we have a pretty good crew out in the California whole West Coast side now for uh, helping out out there. So by all means, if you think you've got a school, approach them, see what they think and go for a, getting a proposal in. We are, as I say, we got till November 24th uh, for the second half of 2021. So we'll, if you need help, let me know. Dan, you can forward my email address to everybody too. I'll be glad to do that. Need help? We can. I can help them uh, work through the proposal process uh, uh, or whatever they might need help with. So. That's great. Appreciate that. Are there any more questions or comments? 
Just one quick comment. I think the parents and the teachers are more excited to speak to someone in space than the kids are. I mean, the, the parents just literally explode in pride when they see the school kids talking to the astronauts. To the kids, it's just another way of contacting. But to the parents, it's just an amazing event. Yeah, because they've grown up with the moon stuff and everything. Yep. And yeah, that's usually what happens. As, as I say to the schools, I don't know what happens one microsecond after the contact's done. The kids are usually yelling and screaming, high-fiving. But the parents, as you're saying, they are basically crying. Yep. And yep. hugging each other. Mm -hmm. Maybe not so much these days with COVID, but before pre-COVID. But yep. We had one school where the principal immediately wanted to try to form an amateur radio club right after the contact because he saw the interest in amateur radio in the school. And they immediately formed an amateur radio club. He was, he was so proud of his kids. It was amazing. This is well, I, as I say, schools have done that. And Daryl was out at a school today handheld radio somebody asking earlier about the handheld radio they were able to listen to the contact that school is actually scheduled for one later sometime in the near future and now there sounds like they are super gung-ho so that's on the if you if you i do post the schedule by all means take an ht to a school and let them listen they don't have to try to talk just let them listen and say hey how do we do that yep so well, hopefully this, uh, this presentation is going to be put in the hands of some schools, some principals, and some uh, across the country, and you'll get a lot more applications for it also. Good. Very good. Okay. Do I see more questions? Yep. Yeah, Dave, you got your hand up. Yeah. Just, uh, I was at Ramona today uh, with Norm, and uh, when they did the contact this morning at 930, and uh, you're right, the parents were the ones that were very excited. The kids just sort of walked through and did their questions and, uh, and moved on. But the parents were, uh, were very excited about, uh, about the whole thing, as well as the amateur radio group that was there. They, uh, they had never done that before, so it was a first time for them as well. Yeah. So it, was, it was good. It was a lot of fun. It's really pretty cool. I did a school in Illinois. Um, we, we did a setup on a Saturday, and there were about 10 or 12 of the ha local hams. And at that time, Bill MacArthur was on board, and he was making general contacts. He made like 1,800 contacts. And so uh, I said, we got everything set up. And I said, oh, I said, uh, there's an ISS pass coming in in like 10, 15 minutes. Bill has been on. Let's see if we can make contact with him. This is on Saturday. I turned the automatic rotor control on, and uh, sure enough, he came on, he was talking to people. I started to make a call. The microphone was literally ripped out of my hand. There was like six guys. They just made a quick call. Bill said, hi, exchange call signs. One of those guys was mid eighties and he's crying. Another guy was in his seventies, I think. The rest were all younger. And they said, this is the best contact they'd ever had it's like really but i mean they were just totally stunned and then of course they helped out for the actual contact a few days later at the high school but uh you just never know what's going to happen with one of these well if you're going to bed or have a wish for luck this is the type of stuff to put your bets in yep okay i don't see more hands up barry do you see anything in the questions mm -hmm. How do we get a copy of the link for the presentation if we're not part of the group? And it's also a question of how do you get on the email list? Okay, uh, if you've got this via email, hopefully you'll get the follow-up. Uh, I'll do a follow-up and we'll have the video, we'll have all the information, the chat, everything will be a part of that. And you'll be able to download the video um, and for your school or for your ham clubs activities, whatever you wanna do and we'll make that uh, available to you. So however you got this thing, backtrack it and there'll be that, probably sometime tomorrow I'll get that out. I'm uh, typing my uh, email address. So um, if you wanna email me, go right ahead. And uh, uh, let's see the question, what the call sign of, uh, that, well, uh, Leroy was using uh, NA1SS, um, and 
right off the top of my head, I don't remember his ex his own call sign. But um, um, anyway, and, my my email address is there if people got got questions. Anyone that assesses what the space station call sign is. Yep, that's one of the uh, uh, one of the call signs. The other most famous one is RS zero ISS. That's the Russian. Right, that's for the Russians. Yep. There's some other ones. So. Yep. All right. Well, uh, it's going on quite a while. Not a problem. We just keep going. Are there any more questions? Groups IO and it's SEC dash AR. Yes. What is, what is the what is what is the groups IO address? I'll send it. I'll send all that in the email, or I can type. I can type it in the chat. Yes, type it in the chat. Because there's someone that's not SEC. You got it. Okay. But that's everything from the chat. Okay, hang on. There we go. There we go. Paste. Okay, it's in chat, folks. It just says groups. Here we go. Okay, we got it. Yep. Okay, I think we're we're good to okay. go. Okay, it looks like we're we're done for now. No hands up. Don't worry. This has been a great presentation, and uh, look forward to hearing from folks. Give us a uh, give us uh, your emails to us and uh, any suggestions. And best of seventy threes to everybody. Seventy three on. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you, Charlie, you. for coming. Thank you, and thank you, Oscar, for your part of this. And thank you, Charlie. Hey, thanks. Thank you all. Thanks, great job, guys.